Aunt Lycia of Night Owl Stories, and tonight I'm going to narrate another short story in my new Tales of the Shtetl collection. This one is called The Meanest Goose in Creation, and it chronicles the deep friendship between a postmaster and his pet goose, a vicious creature which terrorizes the shtetl. So lie back, relax, and enjoy as I take you on a journey into the past. After his father's premature death, Teva inherited the family farm, which in truth was no farm at all, since Jews were not allowed to be farmers, strictly speaking. Instead, like its owners, it had a multitude of purposes serving mainly as a Jewish house, a mix of trading post, post office, and general store. It had an orchard in back and a few discreet plots to grow hardy things like potatoes and cabbage. It was a crumbling building with a thatch roof, and business was anemic, especially as the railroads and factories in Minsk were expanding. As an investment, Teva acquired a goose. This goose, he was told, would lay a great many eggs for years to come and be a stellar breeder if the eggs were left to hatch. Unlike his wife, Teva was not much of a haggler and paid quite a bit more for the goose than she would have. I hope that animal was worth the premium, she said all the more acidly as money was tight. Teva's goose was everything the seller had promised, except for a few quirks that took on a life of their own. While most geese are ornery, this one was vicious like no other and attacked every animal and person in sight. No need for a guard dog with such a goose on hand. Teva's children were afraid of it. Teva's wife gave it a wide berth, and any store customer made sure the infamous goose was not on the loose. Requests for deliveries increased, and walk-ins grew scarce. Teva's wife argued that the goose lost them more business than it made them. The argument simmered for years, but it always ended up in the same way, with Teva dismissing his wife's concerns. You're being shrill, he would say, and it doesn't suit you. What happened to the lovely, accommodating girl I married, hmm? This drove her mad, and she had to storm off rather than scream. Teva's stubbornness was not completely unreasonable. His experience with the goose was quite different from anyone else's. When he first acquired it, he would approach it with cooing noises and whispered terms of endearment, and it would allow him to come quite close and feed it. In time, it went so far as to rub its beak against his forearm after being fed. An extraordinary gesture of affection from such a malicious animal. <laughs> Teva named his goose Schneeweiss for the immaculate color of its feathers, and together they would stand by the store's crumbling stairs and look up for minutes on end at the passing clouds. Schneeweiss would sway with the melodious flow of Teva's nattering and resonate with his moods, honking when he seemed agitated. You understand me better than anyone, he'd say. And under his loving ministrations, 
The goose laid hundreds of eggs and produced many valuable offspring that brought in vital income for Teva's family. Probably enough to offset the drop in custom, but not enough to assuage Teva's wife. No one besides Teva liked the goose, and the hostility was mutual. In fact, it took all the blind power of rutting for the gander to overcome its terror and mount the fearsome thing. Teva didn't care. He loved his white feathered friend, his winged companion. Inevitably, Schneeweiss reached the end of its years as a breeder. Teva's wife knew how much he cared about the vicious goose, and she gave him more than enough time to get used to what must happen next. When he refused to even bring up the matter, she did. It's time for the goose to serve its last purpose, she said. We've been feeding it with nothing in return. Now it must feed us. How can you say that? Teva cried with unexpected vehemence. When she has served us so faithfully. I wish people took after Schneeweiss. There would be more loyalty in the world. And more wars, the wife thought to herself. Calm yourself, my husband. I'm only speaking reasonably, as anyone would. You have always hated Schneeweiss, Teva remarked. Well, if you don't trust me, then ask your friends, she spat, her patience at an end. And don't expect a hot meal tonight. <laughs> Teva went to sit by the goose in a state of great distraction. I went too far, he said dolefully, his legs shaking, his arms flailing about. Why should I be ashamed of the bond you and I have? He turned to Schneeweiss and looked it in the eye. What sort of man doesn't love his pet? The goose shuddered and shook its head in apparent agreement. Not to mention how unfair this all is, he added. We've conquered all there is to conquer, leaving no place for other creatures. If it were not for people, you'd be flying free and happy towards warmer climes. At this, the Schneeweiss reared up its head and flapped its wings. Yes, Teva concluded in the tenderest of tones. Yes, we are always on the same page, you and I, aren't we? Uh, that night, Teva had a vivid and inscrutable dream. Schneeweiss appeared to him as a giant goose, and suddenly he could understand what it said. Climb onto my back, Teva. Teva hesitated. But there's no saddle. No need, the goose said. Just go with it. And off they went, straight up into the skies, flying through the clouds, headed south for days and weeks on end. Teva hugged Schneeweiss's fluffy neck down, and felt exhilarated. Finally, tropical islands clad in emerald jungles and edged with fine sandy beaches came into sight. Teva's wonder and bliss were so intense that he woke up. That day, he took his wife's sarcastic advice and asked three of his friends to come and advise him about the matter of his goose. The first was 
Hatsuko, the butcher, a practical man renowned for his common sense. The second was Isur, the cobbler and part-time Torah student. And the third was Menachem, who had recently taken over the bakery. Menachem was the youngest of the bunch and was quite enamored with the new philosophies and scientific ideas being discussed in the big cities. Gentlemen, Teva began, my goose is well past her breeding years and my wife wants me to... He couldn't get himself to finish the sentence. The butcher had to fill in the blanks. Kill it? Teva looked down at his feet. Yes, but I just can't do it. I think of Schneeweiss as a pet, a friend even. Who kills a friend for meat? Am I being unreasonable? As always, there's at least two sides to every story, Isur said. Mm, this was going to be a long-winded affair, and Teva decided to make tea for everyone and bring it out so that they could drink it as they sat and discoursed on the porch steps. It was a warm day, and the few clouds that hung motionless in the sky reminded Teva of his dream. Before Isur resumed, the goose came around the corner of the house and stared at the assembled men, causing even Hatzko to recoil in fear. That's uncanny, he grumbled. Perhaps we should be careful what we say. And now you're being silly, Menachem commented, implying he didn't think much of Teva's quandary. Isur cleared his throat. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, one might say this is a test of your willingness, Teva. Your wife is acting on Hashem's behalf and asking you to sacrifice something you hold dear for the good of your family. Think of Abraham when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Surely you are not above our forefather. Teva had no retort for such a powerful point. On the other hand, Isur continued, I'm reminded of the prophet Nathan's diatribe against the adulterous David. Does it not say in Samuel 12, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up and it grew up together with him? And with his children, it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Is this not the case with you? Teva felt like crying. Isur, it is as if you had penetrated my innermost soul. I am that poor man and Schneeweiss is that lamb and my daughter. Thus you could argue with your wife, Isur concluded. If you want to seem slippery to her, Menachem interjected, ignoring Isur's glare. And a pompous fool besides. Teva was crestfallen. I thought you would side with me, Menachem. And Schneeweiss? <laughs> There are no sides in this matter, Menachem remonstrated. When we speak of friendship between animals and people, we fool ourselves. We domesticate animals to serve a functional purpose, to feed us, transport us, pull our plows, or, as in the case of dogs, to protect us or herd other creatures. 
Any closeness that might arise is an imitation of what transpires between humans and blinds us to our own desire for domination. Teva gave him a blank look. I have no idea what you mean. Isur had a triumphant smile and Menachem bit his lip. All right then, the baker said. Let me be crystal clear. Nature is red in tooth and claw. To kill your goose and feed your family is not a violation, but a continuation of the natural order. Isur's smile vanished. All 613 mitzvot are an attempt to go against the tyranny of the natural order. Morality does not follow the dictates of nature. And yet, Menachem countered, science tells us that our precious morality is a product of a subtle calculus which occurs in recesses of the mind that we do not control. Anathema, Isur cried. Chatzko calmed the antagonists, assuring them that this was not helping their friend one bit. The goose swayed in apparent enjoyment of the debate. Teva put his head in his hands. The men were quiet for a moment, and Schneeweis honked, as if to bring them back to the matter at hand. Chatzkal started and stared daggers at the bird. And if you can't make up your mind, Teva, I can do the deed for you, he said, placing his meaty hand on his friend's shoulder. That would be humane and proper, Isur declared. If that matters, Menachem said. And so the debate went back and forth, passionate and increasingly perplexing, as such discussions often go, until the sun was well into its afternoon descent. Suddenly, Teva's wife trotted out of the store with a butcher's knife in hand and took in the four squawking men and the mocking goose. She kissed the top of her husband's head and jumped at the goose with such speed that the animal barely had time to react. When its brain ordered its legs to flee, it was too late. Its head had been severed and the wife was already draining it of its blood. The four friends gaped at the fierce wife, three of them in secret admiration. That afternoon, Teva's children gleefully plucked the goose, even though it's hard and nasty work. And the next night, a delicious meat-enhanced cholent was served to Teva's family. Herschel had already come to claim the goose's feathers and all its edible parts had been prepared. The goose served us to the last, Teva's wife said, and for that we are grateful. And now people won't be scared to come see us anymore, Teva's son muttered. And with that, the passing of Schneeweiss was summarily consecrated. As for Teva, he could not get himself to eat the cholent and never had a piece of flesh again.